Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. And I went to church for many years. I never understood the power of my words. Did not understand them at all. Therefore, I just said what I wanted to anytime I wanted to. And I was just constantly grieving the Holy Spirit and opening doors for the enemy in my life and didn't even know it. In the Bible, uh, the Holy Spirit is sometimes symbolized by a dove. Now, why a dove? Why not a pigeon or an eagle or, you know, something else? Why a dove? Well, because a dove is a very gentle, not only beautiful, but a very gentle bird. And the Holy Spirit is very gentle. The Holy Spirit is not a dove, but he's symbolized in the Bible by oil, by wind, by a dove. If we would look at Matthew 3:16 for just a second, we would see that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus at his baptism. When Jesus was baptized, he went up at once out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he, John, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And that's found in, in, out of the four Gospels, that's found in three places. It also says that in other places that he, he, he had the Spirit without measure, and the Spirit came and remained. Well, I love the fact that he had the Spirit without measure, and I know that we all have the Holy Spirit, but I think sometimes we limit the flow of the Holy Spirit in our lives because we don't know how to really properly behave ourselves in a way so this wonderful, beautiful, gentle, loving, kind, comforting Holy Spirit can have full play in our lives. He's gentle. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. I heard this story. There was a couple who lived in an apartment in New York. It was very hot in the summer and they had their, they had their windows open a lot. There was a window ledge there and quite often pigeons would come and roost on their windowsill and many times they would be arguing or bickering and having heated conversation and the pigeons always stayed. But there was also a dove that came and they began to notice that every time that they argued and the dove was there, the dove would flee away. You can have pigeon religion if you want to. <laughs> and maybe you can have pigeon religion and fight and argue and be full of bitterness and resentment and have all kinds of bad attitudes and you can go to church and just, you know, be a pigeon all you want to. The pigeons will stay. But uh, the dove dwells in a peaceful, loving atmosphere. How many of you know it's very hard to hear from God if you're mad and upset? very hard to be led by the Holy Spirit. We just get into ourselves and into our flesh and we don't even know what's going on and we've already done one thing that's stupid, now we keep doing stupid things because we won't calm down enough to let God speak to us. We, now listen to what I'm gonna say. We can and need to create an atmosphere in our lives and in our homes that the Holy Spirit can be very comfortable in all the time. Now, I'm gonna say that again because this is important. We, each one of us, nobody can do this for us. We need to create and maintain an atmosphere in our homes, in our jobs as much as we can, in our relationships, in our friendships. We need to create an atmosphere that is peaceful and loving and calm and not volatile. One where the Holy Spirit is comfortable to have full play in that atmosphere. And we can do that. And moms, let me just say a special word to you this morning. You know, as mom goes, so the house goes. Now, I'm not saying that the men don't have responsibility here because they absolutely do. Men should be peacemakers in their homes. But women do sometimes have a tendency to set the tone in your home. 
And so I encourage you to spend a little bit of time talking to God in your bed every morning before you ever put one little tipsy toe on the ground. Because I can tell you without him all over you, you are going to act bad. And I am going to act bad. And I don't want to do that. I want to get up and maintain an atmosphere in my home that my children can grow and nurture in. Mine aren't home anymore, but I learned how to do this when they were. And I want to get along with my husband. I want us to, to be peaceful and, and to represent Christ in a great way. I don't want to be mad at somebody all the time and arguing and, and losing my peace. I have to have the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. And if I didn't want to get along with people for any other reason, I would do it just so I could have the full presence of the Holy Spirit in my life because we cannot do without Him. Now, to be honest, sometimes today I don't think we hear enough about the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this. I shared last night that I went to church for probably a good 12 years. And I mean, we were there regular. I was on the church board. Dave was an elder in the church. So it wasn't like we didn't have any degree of sincerity. But I'll tell you what I did not have any degree of, and that was victory. You say, well, why weren't you having any victory? Well, I knew all about what God had, but I didn't know what I had. I knew he was powerful, but I didn't know that I could be powerful. I knew there was a Holy Spirit, but I didn't know he wanted to come and live on the inside of me and live in close fellowship with me. I called on God when, when I had an emergency and I didn't realize that I lived in an emergency. I didn't realize everything in my life was an emergency. <laughs> All the little stuff I tried to handle and then when I got around to something big, I would take that to God and I finally found out that everything to God is little, so we might as well just let him in on everything that goes on in our lives. So I just, before I just go on, I want to say again, the Holy Spirit is so valuable, so valuable to us. And you're going to find out in my teaching tonight that sometimes the way we live, the Holy Spirit is not even present anymore. When I say that, it's not, he never goes away. He, he's with us to stay. But we have to have his manifest presence in our life. We need to give him full reign, and we, we need to have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which is the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit on our lives. Trust me, you would not want me up here for five minutes if I was not anointed to do what I'm doing. This is not something that I just went somewhere to school and learned how to do, and I've gotten pretty good at it over the years. I mean, I'm anointed to do this. And you are anointed by God to do what you do. And if you don't do it under the anointing and with the anointing, you're not going to do it very well. If you want to be successful, you don't need to go to a 12-part series on how to be successful in business. You need to have more and more of the Holy Spirit on your life, leading you and guiding you and showing you what to do. So the Holy Spirit is extremely valuable, and we need to cooperate with Him in every way that we can so He can stay with us at all times remain with us and so we can have the spirit without measure in our life i don't want just a, a a little tiny bit to get by i want to help people i want to bless people i want to get my mind off myself and keep my mind off myself i want to walk in love and in order to do that i need the holy spirit everybody say i need the holy spirit, the holy spirit. all right let's look at ephesians 4. the bible says that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And I hope that sounds as awful to you as it does to me. Just imagine grieving the Holy Spirit. And actually, I'm sure we all do it a lot more than we would like to realize that we do. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not offend or vex or sadden Him, by whom you were sealed, marked, and branded as God's own, and secured for the day of redemption, the final deliverance through Christ from evil and the consequences of sin. So God's given us this wonderful gift to be with us. We're actually sealed or preserved by the Holy Spirit. If you think about it, if you go and you buy something at the store and you don't want it to 
decay, you will seal it in something. Make sure that nothing gets to it. And I love the fact that we are sealed in the Holy Spirit, protected from the decay that's in our society. And we just have wonderful protection from the Holy Spirit. And we don't want to do anything to damage or break that seal or open a door for the enemy to get into our lives. Now, you don't really get the full thing by just looking at verse 30. We have to look at verse 29 and verse 31. It's always good to kind of read the stuff around the scripture that you're looking at to make sure you're taking it in context. So verses 29 and 31 tell us how we grieve the Holy Spirit. And it's practical stuff for everyday life. Every single person can take this and go out of here today and just be so much better. Let no foul or polluting language nor evil word nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth but only the speech that is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others. There we go. We got to talk about the mouth again. <laughs> right away, right off the bat, the first thing he wants to get into is watch your mouth. Why is it that the way we talk can grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, simply because the power of life and death is in the tongue. And to be honest, if we really believed it, I mean really believed it, we would be more careful about what we say. And maybe a better way to say it is to say that to whatever degree we believe it, to that degree we are careful about what we say. Now I've become a lot more careful about what I say over the years and it's still something that I study on a regular basis. I mean regularly, one, one morning last week in my fellowship time with God, I did my own little Bible study on the power of words again because I'm a talker and people that are talkers can get themselves in big trouble because sometimes they just talk, 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 Half the time don't even know what they're saying. Talk, 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 talk. Amen. And words are very important. Words are containers for power. I've done a lot of writing, a lot of teaching on the power of words. If, if you do not understand what I'm talking about, and here again, I went to church for many years. I never understood the power of my words, did not understand them at all. Therefore, I just said what I wanted to anytime I wanted to. And I was just constantly grieving the Holy Spirit and opening doors for the enemy in my life and didn't even know it. Well, if you've been doing that, Maybe before you didn't know, but now I'm announcing and declaring unto you that your words are powerful. The power of life and death is in the tongue, and they who indulge it must eat the fruit of it, rather for life or death. Amen. And yes, I'm talking to all you watching by TV too. Don't think I'm ignoring you. I can just see you right now in your homes, in my heart, just going, well, maybe this isn't for me. Well, it is for you. It is for you. So it's interesting that he starts out and says, be very careful how you talk. And he's saying, when you talk to one another, and I might add, when you talk about one another, uh-oh. See, I, you can tell that's touchy. You could just hear by the little rumble that went through the crowd. Because we do like to talk about each other, don't we? This says that we should only say things that are good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of other people. In other words, when we talk to someone, we should always make them feel better. We should always encourage them along their way. And yes, that can include correction, but even correction should be given in a right way. It doesn't have to be harsh and, you know, full of pride and arrogance. It can be done in a right way. We need to correct if we have authority in someone's life to do it, but we want to be careful not to overcorrect and not to break their spirit. So even that needs to be done by the leadership of the Holy Ghost. We need to make people feel better about themselves. And when we're talking to other people about other people, we need to protect people's reputations and not try to ruin it. Let's just think for just a minute about how our lives would change. How much better we would feel 
if everything that we said was something worth saying. Bye. I'll just leave you with that because I got to go on. <laughs> and don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't offend or vex or sadden him in whom you are sealed. Verse 31, let all bitterness and indignation and wrath, passion, rage, bad temper, resentment, anger, animosity, quarreling, brawling, clamor, contention, slander, evil speaking, abusive or blasphemous language <laughs> be banished from you. Along with it, all malice, spite, ill will, or baseness of any kind. So what do we see here if we just want to get real practical? And you know, the Word of God is very practical. I'm so grateful that this is not just something that just floats around over our head. I hope when you leave here today and somebody says to you, what did Joyce preach on today, that you're going to be able to tell them at least something <laughs> that you heard, that you can take home and put to use in your life. So we see that we have this gift of this amazing, wonderful Holy Spirit in our life, the third person of the Trinity, God Himself, who is living in us, not just with us, but living in us, leading us, guiding us, convicting us, teaching us, helping us, comforting us, counseling us, everything we need. And He says, now be careful how you handle this precious gift in your life. Live carefully. Don't vex, don't vex, offend, or sadden him. And by the way, here's how you can do it. If you say wrong things that are going to minister death, that's going to grieve the Holy Spirit. And if you get angry and bitter and resentful, and you're full of unforgiveness, and you're arguing and fighting, do you know when we argue and fight and rant and rave at home behind closed doors and then march off to church on Sunday morning, that really doesn't please God. I mean, it's good that we go to church. Maybe we'll get some help there while we're there. But, you know, we need to realize that we can't be phony about this. Being one thing in church on Sunday morning and something else at home behind closed doors and at work and out in the marketplace. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a Sunday morning church service. I am the way that you live. Follow me, he told his disciples. Come and learn of me, for I am humble, gentle, meek, and lowly. I am not harsh, hard, sharp, and pressing. We are being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Every believer's goal should be to be like Jesus. Do you know that all unforgiveness grieves the Holy Spirit? And I can tell you there are people in here this morning, you love God, but you walked in angry. And the truth is, if you don't listen, you'll go home and be angry. You may have even come here with somebody you're angry at. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you fought all the way here and thought you'd straighten up long enough to be in the building. And I mean, I know because Dave and I used to do it all the time. So it's not, it's not, I'm not just throwing stones at you. I'm saying I get it. I understand. But you know, when I learned, now listen to me, when I learned what I was giving up to have my little temper fit, are you listening to me? When I learned what I was sacrificing in order to say what I wanted to say, no matter who it hurt, then I decided to value the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life more than me getting to say what I wanted to say, or being able to have the last word with Dave, or trying to prove that I was right, or trying to argue my point. Because can I tell you the truth? Most of the stuff that we make a fuss over really doesn't make any difference in the long run. I mean, at least if you're going to battle, pick your battles wisely. And at least if you're going to fight, have fight about something that matters. Not over which way to go to the grocery store or picking your socks up out of the floor. I mean, it's like, or putting the lid on the toothpaste. I mean, it's just, it's not worth it. Everybody say, it's not worth it. <laughs> well, bless God, if they don't change, I just can't stand it. Well, what condition would we be in if God had that attitude with us?
You've had your mother do this to you, haven't you? I mean, seriously, what condition, what condition would we be in if God had the attitude toward us that we have toward people? I'm not putting up with that one more day. If you don't straighten up and straighten up fast, I'm out of here. Come on, how, is anybody getting it? <laughs> how about let's be in a little more long suffering? A little more patient. How about let's believe that people can change? How about if we believe that if we pray for people and just be a good example in front of them? How about that? How about if we just shut up and be a good example in front of people? Would that work for anybody? A consistent good example. I, I was a nightmare when Dave and I got married. I didn't want to be. I'd been hurt. And I was wounded and my soul was messed up. I didn't know how to be in relationship with anybody. And he was a mature believer. And mature believers, <laughs> mature believers, mature believers. Hey, when Dave got me, he got what he prayed for. Because he was wanting to get married and he prayed for God to give him a wife and he said, God, make it somebody that needs help. So he got exactly what he asked for. But the thing is, is he was also ready to handle it because for at least three years, not three days or three weeks, for at least three years, Dave was just a stable example in front of me of love and stability and peace. And I had never seen that. I grew up in a very volatile atmosphere. I had never, I didn't even really know what peace was, if you want to know the truth, nor did I know what love was. I didn't know what it was. And if you've never had any experience with anything, somebody just telling you what it is doesn't work. Somebody's got to show you. <laughs> Are you with me? Somebody has to show us. And that's why it's so important for us as believers to get out in the world and walk in love. And not just try to tell everybody they need to go to church. Well, it wasn't too long. It probably seemed like a long time to Dave, I'm sure. But I started wanting what he had. That's why the Bible says that we are salt and light. Our lives should make somebody thirsty for what we have. And so I thank God that Dave didn't try to talk me into changing. He just was in front of me. Now, let me also say that Dave had the power of the Holy Spirit in his life because you cannot do for somebody what Dave did for me if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. But if you do have the power that I'm talking about this weekend, the full power of the Holy Spirit diffused throughout your souls flooding every area of your life and you know how to maintain that by staying in close fellowship with God then I want to tell you that God can use you he can put you in difficult places and you can be there and be Dave was happy my attitude I'm sure he didn't like it but he didn't let it steal his joy he just more or less had the attitude well I'm going to be happy I wish you'd be happy with me but if you're not I'm going to be happy anyway and so the point is, now listen to me, when you're full of God, when you have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, your circumstances and the people around you don't have to make you unhappy. Are you with me? Do you know the Bible says that we can grieve the Holy Spirit? We can even quench the Spirit in our lives by not walking in love. We need to learn how to protect the anointing on our life, and that anointing is the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells with us. 
We need to learn how to not live in strife and to be quick to forgive and not be angry and be careful what we say and a lot of things. And I'm grateful that God is always teaching us. It's exciting to me. And He teaches us by using the Word of God. Well, I'm here in Sri Lanka and with me are some medical professionals that have volunteered their time to come here and help hurting people. And if you're a medical professional, a doctor, a dentist, a nurse, pharmacist, a chiropractor, please consider volunteering to come and help people who otherwise wouldn't have any help. So what do you think? Is this a good thing to do? Yeah! <laughs> 